Every now and then a news story comes up that reminds us that Canada's far-right movements are not only dangerous, they're also weird as hell. And this remarkable report from Luke Lebrun and Press Progress really sums that up. You see, there were a group putting on a book festival in Ottawa, and they were highlighting a number of far-right speakers. You had folks like Randy Hillier and Maxime Bernier, Andrew Lawton, bunch of yahoos. But what I want to talk about is how bizarre the event itself is. Because the whole thing is built off of so many lies. So many lies. Also, it's hosted by former Much Music VJ Bill Walichka. Disappointing, Bill Walichka. But like, this is one of the ads. This is an ad for the Ottawa International Food and Book Expo. What kind of books they selling, man? But also, they duped the Mexican embassy into participating. They were hosting a celebration of Mexican-Canadian literature, but then they figured out what the event was and pulled out. But it gets even stranger. This whole thing's organized by a guy named Ray Samuels. Now, he insists he's not at liberty to discuss a whole bunch of things. But it's also unclear who the other employees are, or whether or not they're real. You see, there's another employee named Paul Tremblay. No photos of him exist. And all evidence of him was created by Samuels' publishing company. He has a book called Justin Trudeau and the COVID-19 Biometric Vaccine Totalitarian Agenda. He basically just played buzzword bingo. The other one is Justin Trudeau, Judicial Corruption, and the Supreme Court of Canada, Aliens and Archons in Our Midst. And then a third book about expanding the CFL, because why not? The other co-organizer also doesn't exist. There's a person named John Stokes, the other employee of the festival. And look at this smiling photo of John Stokes. He's here to help you get your book sold. One snag, he is a stock photograph. What is happening? When he was asked whether or not Stokes is a real person, Ray Samuels complained about American-style journalism and media ethics, rather than just, you know, introducing them to the real person. Is this person real? How dare you ask? Don't worry, though. John Stokes is an authority on what's real, as he appears to be quite concerned about aliens. Okie dokie. And there's just so much shadiness here. Like, they faked sponsors. They're claiming that they were sponsored by a CBS affiliate who did not sponsor them. They also claim they were sponsored by the Hill Times newspaper in the Ottawa Public Library. Again, both of which did not sponsor them. They are just making stuff up. This whole thing is bizarre. This is a book festival in Ottawa that huge swaths of it just don't exist. But don't worry, they insist they're not grifters. Totally not grifters. This looks like a grift, but it's something different. Don't ask how or why. Just is. The Canadian government continues to say one thing and do another when it comes to Israel and Palestine. Because in February, the federal government promised to impose sanctions on leadership of both Hamas and Israel. And since then, they have imposed sanctions. Only on one side, though. So Melanie Jolie announced on February 3rd that there was going to be sanctions on leaders of Hamas and extremist Israeli settlers. Since then, the sanctions against the Palestinians have been rolled out. There have been no sanctions against Israelis. And when she was asked directly about it, she didn't really have much to say. She said, quote, We will be imposing sanctions on Israeli settlers. We've said it and we'll do it. And when she was asked about a timeline, she said, It will be coming. It was three months ago. You've had three months to roll these out. And you rolled out the sanctions on Hamas. So what's going on? feel like Canadians are entitled to answers. I mean, at present, the United States have more standing sanctions on Israelis than Canada does. That's where we're at. We've sanctioned Hamas, just not violent Israeli settlers. And there is no explanation for why. Even though they said they would. I think Canadians deserve answers. Ontario Education Minister Stephen Lecce, pictured here starring in a community theatre reenactment of the Blair Witch Project, is going to solve all of the problems in Ontario schools simultaneously. At least he'd like to have you think so. You see, rather than funding or supporting schools, he's got a solution. Banning cell phones. Just a blanket cell phone ban. As they are planning to roll out an incredibly strict cell phone ban in schools. There appear to be no details whatsoever, but it's going to be some sort of regulation that gets cell phones out of the classroom. Even though there are already regulations that get cell phones out of the classroom. They rolled those out in 2019, but they were useless. I'm sure these ones won't be useless. Stephen Lecce is known for not doing useless things. <laughs> so long as you don't look at his track record at all. But this is really emblematic of the way that Lecce runs education. 
The solution that he brought forward is just telling teachers to do more, to become the cell phone cops in their classrooms. And, as is his way, Stephen Lecce has rolled out a policy that doesn't deal with the subtleties at all. Like, I have students who monitor their blood sugar for their diabetes using a cell phone. That's how they control their insulin pump. What are they meant to do? Like, I have students who struggle working in a noisy classroom, so they work with headphones. That helps them work and learn. Guess that's gone. But even more than that, these kids are going to be going into a world where they're going to be interacting with technology. Is the solution a blanket ban, or is the solution rules and guidance that helps them to navigate their relationship with these devices? Simply telling kids, you're never allowed to do this thing, isn't going to work. Like, are we going to start searching backpacks? Is that the plan here? Like, vaping's banned in schools has been the whole time. And as we all know, nobody vapes in high school. Like, rules are one thing, enforcement's another. All they're doing is just telling teachers to become cops. Not going to work. Swing and a miss, Leche. New Brunswick Premier Blaine Higgs, pictured here in an old photo where he looks like an evil version of Alex Trebek, continues to be unimaginably corrupt. This time, it's flipping tax dollars to his friends, who just happen to be high-priced consultants. Funny how conservatives are all about saving money, except when it comes to giving enormous stacks of money to people directly connected to them. They love doing that. So this story centers around two consultants, Derek Robinson and the terrifically named Steve Outhouse. Two very noted conservative consultants. So Outhouse is the campaign manager for Blaine Higgs' conservative re-election bid, but he's also working on a taxpayer's salary in the Premier's office as his principal secretary. So he's working for the party as a consultant and for the Premier as a taxpayer-funded secretary. But he insists that is in no way a conflict of interest. Quote, There are no taxpayer dollars used for the political role in any of this. Somehow, that portion of his brain just deactivates when he's working as secretary. Quote, the separation between the night duties and the day duties would be very clear. Okay, nobody believes you. And Higgs offered the same assessment of Robinson's company, MASH Strategy, insisting that those are going to be sitting in silos, completely different. Even though MASH Strategy's slogan is, quote, think politically, act creatively. They're certainly doing that, creatively helping themselves to taxpayer funds. $72,000 to MASH Strategies, which Higgs insists is just, quote, a very small portion of how much they spend on communication services. We spend way more than that on consulting, guys. Come on. And we know that Steve Outhouse is getting paid significantly more than the normal $150,000 to $175,000 salary for a principal secretary. Because he's getting paid $125,000 to work for the premier's office until the election. So we're all about cutting the fat, except when it comes to our own consultants. There we'll run up the bill. <sighs> Cost savings for thee, but never for me. This person's asking a fantastic question. How does one get into politics? In Canada, how do you get into politics? It's not the simplest question. Depends on the party, depends on a lot of different things. Like, if you want to run as an independent, that's one very complicated path. You're likely going to want to run as a part of a party just so that you have the infrastructure, the funding. So the step one is to find a party that aligns with your values, or at least closely so. Once you've done that, get involved. So parties select candidates through constituency associations. So that's where you want to start working. Get connected in your constituency association. Get to know people, because the people who show up at the meetings are the people who pick the candidate. Build connections, build relationships, and then run for the party nomination in your constituency. Then you're running. Then you're a candidate. Then you pound the pavement. Now, running for elected office isn't for everybody, and that's not the approach everybody chooses to take. There's a lot of different ways to enact change. But we need good people running for office. So if you're thinking about it, go for it. This person's asking a simple question. How would I adjust income redistribution? Super simple. We look back over the history of Canada to when we were thriving as a nation and we bring our tax rates closer to the way they were back then. If you look at the 50s and the 60s when Canada was booming, the marginal tax rate on the wealthiest people was over 80%. The rich were taxed far more heavily, and Canada was a better country for it. So to adjust income redistribution, very simple. Number one, salary cap. Pick a number, say 15. 
That would mean that the CEO's salary can never be higher than 15 times the lowest paid employee in their building. I don't know what the exact number should be, but something like that. Also, a wealth cap, where all wealth above a certain level gets taxed heavily, or at least taxed enough to slowly shrink that wealth. Something around a 10% wealth tax. That would slowly draw down those individuals' massive stacks of wealth. They don't need it. And massive tax penalties for offshoring your money. Let's start there. How's that for you? This person's responding to a post about gender and pronoun policy and saying, Respect your parents. Use the name they gave you. End of story. No. Respect your children. Use the name they choose. End of story. So if you have two people, one of whom says, This is what I want my name to be, and another person who says, This is what I want your name to be, we're going to side with the person who's got to live with the name. You get to choose how you want to be addressed. Right? Just maybe okay, sure. You get to choose the name you want to be addressed by. Unless you want to speak with your full legal name. We'll wait. But it's about acknowledging somebody's humanity. It's acknowledging them as they wish to be acknowledged. My legal name is Steven. I go by Steve. I've been trying to convince my parents to stop calling me Steven my entire life. They refuse. That has bothered me my entire life. And it's had a negative impact on my relationship with them. And for what? Just for them to feel like they're the boss. Is it worth it? Was the uncomfortable shuffle in the room when they called me Steven at my wedding worth it? Not if you ask me. Because in that moment, was that uncomfortable shuffle about me or was it about them? I don't know about you. I'd rather just call people what they want to be called. Respect them. Not their parents. I don't give a damn about their parents. They don't really get a vote here. So, I made a post yesterday about exploitation, and how workers aren't getting a fair share of the value that they create. And you wind up with a bunch of people talking about this, insisting that the wealthy take all the risk. Like, do the employees on a drilling rig share in the losses on a dry hole? Yes. Do the executives? Do the shareholders? Like, who gets laid off? The staff? Or the management? When was the last time you saw management get laid off? Like, if a well comes up dry, they could still pay the employees. They could keep them on staff, but they don't. They hire contractors, and then they just cut the contracts. Because they can treat people as disposable that way. But don't worry, they don't cut dividends, they don't cut their shareholder payouts. They will cut staff, though. So yeah, you do share in the losses on a dry hole. By losing your job. Do the stockholders share in those losses? Seems to me the line only goes up. Stop sticking up for the wealthy. Why do you care about them? They don't care about you. So whenever you ask about taxing the rich, you get this response. Won't they just leave? No. No, they won't. It's called capital flight, and it doesn't really happen. Most of the historically documented evidence of capital flight happens when economies collapse. And that's usually from things like monetary policy collapse, war, stuff like that. When it comes to hiking taxes, it doesn't really happen. There are lots of places in the world with way higher tax rates than Canada that still have lots of rich people hanging around. Because nobody would just uproot their successful business that made them rich and just leave. Like They would have to start entirely fresh in an entirely new country. And they're not likely to do that. But also, if they do leave, let them. Like, they're currently not contributing. They're taking, not adding. They're paying incredibly low tax rates and taking enormous amounts of money out of the economy and just stockpiling it. Let them go. They help nobody, they improve nothing. But they aren't gonna go, they're just gonna whine to try to keep taxes down. I want to be really clear with this person. Investing is not working hard. Investing is not working. Investing is using your access to capital to benefit from the work of others. If you invest in a company, then the other people who work at that company are doing labor, creating value, and you are taking a portion of the value created by their labor for yourself. You aren't working. You're exploiting. You are taking the value created by somebody else. So what sweat are you actually creating here? Seems to me that out of the people sitting on their lazy backsides, it's not the workers, it's the investors. They just sit in their office and watch BNN all day. 
watch Jim Cramer hit a soundboard. <laughs> it's a real salt mine, I tell ya. Nobody feels bad for investors. Not even a little bit. Hope you lose it all. Have a great day. Join me now as I look into my crystal ball that sees the future. As this person said, they named their kids, and if they want to change it legally when they are of age, they can. Until then, it's the given name. I'm, I'm looking into this person's future, and I see their kids not talking to them. I see them wondering why their kids don't visit at Christmas. I see them wondering why they don't see their grandkids. Could it be because they didn't respect their children and what they think they should be called? No, it's got to be something different. Wokeness! God damn wokeness! Definitely couldn't be the way that you treat them. Like property. I don't know, the future is a little hazy. But your kids won't talk to you, I can say that with confidence. Gonna be awful awkward when everybody else gets visited at the seniors' home. They're just gonna be sitting there wondering, but you'll know. We'll all know. One of the strange things that comes up when you post on here, partners, is that people try to come up with different ways to roast you. And they're always terrible. Like this person, who's repeating what most folks on here say. Sometimes this man wears a hat. Tarnation. Although this one's not a toque, it's more of a Stetson. Although let's explore options. Oh, I like this one. This, this, is, this might be the new hat. It's not a toque, does that make you feel better? This one's quite festive. Although my inclination is to put this one on the ground and dance around it. Arima. Although I think this one might be the one. Because giant frogs, giant frogs, what can I say? Also, the eyes appear to be, like, reflective? I don't know, I'm here for this. Froggy, froggy. But also, if my hats bother you, I really don't care. Also, I don't have ten stupid toques. I, I have quite a few more than that. Try and keep up.